Early morning on the 15th of December 2001 and sister Philomena Lyons waits for a bus to take her to Dublin for the holidays. Hello. Good morning sister, how are you? I'm fine. But it's awful cold. I know, isn't it? Yeah, you're waiting on a bus. Yes, I'm off to Dublin for Christmas. Oh, good for you. Well, have a nice Christmas. I will. All right, you take care of the best. Yes, Bye. happy Christmas. Thank you, you too. She shares a friendly greeting with the local care worker. It was to be her last, because not far away, someone was watching and waiting. Sister Philomena Lyons was called uh, Christina Lyons, and she was born in Rahan in Mallow in 1932 and entered an novitiate in West Cork in 1950. And in 1952, she was professed. Her first assignment was in our own convent school, St. Francis de Sales in Belmore, uh, New Jersey. And she stayed there until 1963. In 1963, she came back to Ireland and then she came to Bally Bay and she was in St. Bridget's National School teaching as a primary school teacher for 34 years and she was actually 51 years as a nun. Sister Philomena was a very spiritual person. She was very loving, kind, compassionate, very bubbly and full of life and she brought joy to those whom she came in contact with she always seemed to be smiling, always seemed to be happy. She seemed very, very peaceful and serene. The morning of the 15th of December in 2001, uh, Philomena rose early, then Sister Aloysius helped her with her luggage and they went down to the bus stop at the convent gate at approximately 8.10 a.m. No, you go back, it's very cold. Well, it is, but are you sure? Yes, yes, I'll oh. be fine. Okay, right, then we won't see you till after Christmas. No, indeed. You should have a lovely, lovely time. I will. And do let us know how you're getting on, won't you? Yes, I will. Well, okay, happy Christmas to you then. Happy Christmas. God bless. Sister Aloysius came back up to the convent at that stage. And through the curtains, she saw this man standing against the pier. And he seemed to be looking in the direction of Valley Bay town, as if he was waiting for a lift from some vehicle or other. But then when she looked the second time, he had disappeared. And from then, she did not think anything about it. Sometime around 10 o'clock on that morning, a lady coming to the convent saw Sister Philomena's bags on the ground beside the convent pier and she came and reported to the sisters that Philomena's bags were there. There seem to be some bags down at the gate. I think they may be Sister Philomena's. What? You'd better bring them in then. Okay. Nothing in the bags was disturbed. The money nor the mobile phone, they were all there. Sister Aloysius contacted our convent in Dublin and told the sister there that tell Sister Philomena not to worry when she arrives because her bags were safe and that I was in Bally Bay at that stage and I would be going to Dublin on the Sunday and I would take her bags with me in the car to Dublin. I'm sure everything's fine, but would you ask her to give me a ring as soon as she gets in? Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. We became very concerned that something was wrong with Sister Philomena when we phoned the convent in Dublin and discovered that Sister Philomena had not arrived. We got extremely worried, extremely concerned. We thought she might have been missing, but we did not think it would end as it did. Hello, uh, this is Sister Aloysius from the Sacred Heart Convent, Bally Bay. It's half four on the 15th of December 2001. I received a report from Carrick and Cross Garda Station stating that an elderly nun by the name of Sister Philomena Lyons had gone missing from the convent in Bally Bay. Just after five o'clock in the day, I called to the convent and I called to um, Sister Aloysius, who was the Mother Superior. She described the nun 
and described that she was wearing a long navy coat over her garments and that she was 69 years of age. I seen a laneway up to the back of the convent so I decided to drive up to the rear of the convent to just give a brief search of the grounds to see could I locate the nun. I came into an open space at the back of the convent. There was a hedge separating the rear of the convent to a field and in the corner there was an open gate. I drove the car into the, the entrance of the gateway and something caught the corner of my eye and I shone my torch on it and I could see that there was something at the entrance of the gateway so I walked towards it and when I got to about six foot away from from the object lying on the ground, I seen that it was that of a, a body of a, an elderly woman. The first thing I did was I phoned 999 on my mobile phone. It's got a doctor here. Could you get an ambulance to Bally Bay, Sacred Heart? The body had appeared to have no pulse and was very cold. I've got a doctor here. Can I cancel that ambulance? The lady's dead. I phoned Sergeant Moore, who was the sergeant in charge of Bally Bay. He then contacted the, a priest and a doctor. The guard came back and he asked for a priest and Monsignor McSurley went to him. I thought that there must have been an accident down the road that the guard would want the priest, but in my wildest dreams, I never connected it with our sister Philomena. My name is Mary Trace Cassidy. I'm the state pathologist for Ireland. And in the course of that, I'm called upon by the Gardaí and the coroners to investigate any suspicious or unusual deaths, and particularly to examine the victims of homicide. In the middle of December 2001, I got a phone call, as most cases do start with a phone call, to say that there was a body of an elderly female had been found in the grounds of the convent, and that it was a, a, a local nun who had gone missing. Part of the examination is not just the examination of the body, but it's looking for trace evidence. And we noticed little hairs and what looked possibly like fibres on it. So we all sort of were very careful. We didn't disturb any of this, this evidence at the time. Then we got in closer to the body, and it was only then that it became obvious that this was the nun, because she obviously had her veil on, and um, that was obviously very sad for everybody concerned to identify that we were dealing with a homicide victim, who in this case was, a, was a, an elderly nun. The obvious thing was that she had a scarf around her neck, and it was tight around her neck, and the unusual thing was that the, her little veil was actually caught in the scarf. Now, she would not have, have dressed herself in that manner. So it was obvious that someone had actually tightened the scarf around her neck. <sighs> On her lower limbs, there were a few small injuries as well. Now, these weren't massive injuries. There were grazes and bruises. The, the pattern of where the injuries were suggests that there may be an element of a sexual assault to this type of, of um, homicide. She was lying and um, uh, with her, her face towards the, to the sky and she'd been wearing spectacles and these had been knocked back. They were still on, on her head but not quite in, in the, the normal position. And her clothing was in a bit of disarray so immediately again we were thinking that possibly there was some other motive for this killing. At that stage, the body was then removed from the grounds of the convent and it was taken to Cavan Hospital for a full examination. And once we got the body into uh, Cavan Hospital and we were in then bright lights, we could then see in great detail exactly what the position was and what we were actually dealing with. Well, on the Sunday morning, it having been established that a murder inquiry was underway, a conference was held in the local hotel, the Riverdale, under uh, the regional commander at the time, Assistant Commissioner Kevin Carty. It was decided that a, a series of checkpoints would be set up around Bally Bay Town on the Monday morning uh, from very early to uh, stop cars coming into work. Uh, 
Every road into the town was to be covered, and there were two Gardaí at each checkpoint. I went to the Riverdale Hotel with Garda Morris Gowan, and uh, we were at the junctions of the Carrick Macross and the Coot Hill Roads, which come into Bally Bay there. Each car we stopped, the one question put to them was, where are you in Bally Bay on Saturday morning uh, between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m.? Everybody that answered in the affirmative was questioned uh, in relation to their activities and what they might have saw in the town that morning. At Cavan General Hospital, forensic pathology procedures were underway. Once we get the person back to the, the mortuary, then we start the examination in full. Now, I don't work on my own. I need uh, a team to, to assist me in this because we have to record everything meticulously. And of course, part of that would be taking photographs. And so in this particular instance, from the Garda photographic section, we had Garda Brian McNamara. We also have other experts who work with us. And one of those would be Mick Martin, who was there for fingerprints. So all of us work together as a team. Um, and it is a, the, the examination of the body in these circumstances is a team effort. Now, obviously, as we were sure that this lady had been strangled, the victim and the perpetrator must have been very close together. So in those cases, there's a very good chance of transfer of evidence from one to the other, particularly in a case like this where, you know, we were literally in the dark about who could have been involved in this. Anything that could help. We had noticed even at the scene that she'd been wearing spectacles, but they weren't in place. And between us, we thought potentially the perpetrator may have touched them, handled them. And so the immediate thought was to pre preserve that. And so the spectacles were taken and they were handed to Mick. By playing the light on the glasses, on the lenses of the glasses, I could see that this actually was a finger mark, what we call a latent finger mark, and that is not immediately visible to the naked eye. To the highest likelihood is that it was a finger mark belonged to the deceased herself because it's unlikely somebody else will have their fingerprints on her glasses. I had a look at the hands of Sister Philomena and I could see that she didn't have any fingerprint patterns on her fingers, which were of horror patterns. So I knew straight away that the finger mark on the glasses were not made by herself. That was then a, a vital part of the, of the evidence right from very early on in the examination. At about 8.30, uh, towards the end of the checkpoint, uh, one car came up to the checkpoint on the Coot Hill Road and uh, it had three uh, young, young men in it. One of those, the backseat passenger, opened the door and was stepping out of the car and I asked him to sit back into the car because I wanted to speak to everybody in the car. I asked the driver of the car that question, had he been in Bally Bay on Saturday morning? And he said to me, no, I wasn't, and my front seat passenger wasn't, but Keelan was, pointing to the youth who had tried to uh, leave the car. I walked to the back driver's door of the car and opened it, and I began by asking him his name and address. Keelan Harrell. Keelan Harrell. And he told me that he had been dropped into town at around 8.15 a.m. by his father and that he was travelling to work at Broomfield, just between Castleblaney and Carrickmacross, to work on a turkey farm there. He said that he stayed in town a short while and that he walked out to the Castleblaney Road in order to get a lift and did get a lift to Castleblaney. And as a result of that, I felt that this was definitely information worth passing on straight away to the investigating team. I went back into the main incident room beside the Garda station and handed it specifically straight into the detectives because I felt uh, it was quite important. So rather than leave it in the pile, I handed it directly into the incident room to be checked. On returning to Garda headquarters that night, we began an examination of the glasses immediately. I decided to photograph the mark as it was on the glasses before attempting any treatment using fingerprint powders or chemicals, whatever the case may be. The reason for this is that it's very, very important to capture any evidence that's present before starting out on a treatment because it's always possible that it could actually ruin the evidence that's there or actually wipe it out. There was a strong possibility that it was belonging to the killer in the case and I knew that it could be a piece of evidence that could break the case wide open or help prove the case. I attempted to lift the finger mark off the glasses using what we call fingerprint tape. 
This technique involves placing an adhesive tape on top of the mark, smoothing it over the mark, and when we peel the tape off, the actual powdered mark sticks to the tape. In this instance, when I tried to lift the mark, it actually destroyed the mark. Oh, Christ. And if we didn't have a photograph of the mark to begin with, we would have lost the evidence in the case. Sister Philomena's murder in Bally Bay at Christmas 2001 sent shockwaves throughout the community and the country as a whole. The police moved quickly to follow up on the fingerprint on Sister Philomena's glasses. It was decided on the Monday, that was the 17th of December, to send two officers out to the Heron family to complete a questionnaire relative to Keelan Heron. Keelan acted normal and was cooperative and completed the questionnaire. The officers then asked him to provide voluntary a set of his fingerprints for elimination purposes, and he did this. Well, when we had learned of the fingerprint on the glasses of Sister Philomena, we faxed up the fingerprints taken from Keelan Heron the following morning. <laughs> This set of fingerprints uh, had the details of uh, Mr. Keelan Hearn as a donor. These prints were submitted for elimination purposes. That is to say, they were taken from a person who was not a suspect in the case, for who they wished to rule out as a donor of the fingerprints in the case. Of all the fingers on the form, the one that was of the best quality was the left forefinger impression. And when I compared the fingerprints of Keelan Hearn with the marks in the glasses, I was astonished that the left forefinger impression was actually the finger that made the mark on the glasses along with Sister Philomena. I, w I was stunned. I wasn't expecting these fingerprints to become uh, identified because he was simply for elimination purposes. Unless this person had a very good reason for having his fingerprints on the glasses, he was going to be a very high suspect in the case. Heron was a 19-year-old farm worker who lived with his parents and younger siblings in Castle Blaney. The family was well respected, and although his academic achievements were poor, Keelan Heron was socially competent and had had a girlfriend for the previous two years. At about six o'clock on Wednesday, the 19th of December 2001, I was in charge of a party of Gardaí who went to the home of Keelan Heron. We entered, we knocked on the door and found that the door was opened. On entering the house, uh, we met Morris Heron, the father of Keelan Heron. I'm a member of Angadishia Corner. I informed him that I had a warrant in my possession to search the house for evidence in relation to the murder of Sister Philip Mina Lyons. Where's your son? We commenced our search and identified the people in the house. Keelan was in a bedroom asleep and I entered this bedroom and I woke Keelan and told him to get up. Please get I then out asked him to put on a white protective suit and we assisted him in doing that. And then we brought him out into the hallway of the house where I informed him that I was arresting him for the murder of Sister Philomena. Do you understand the reason for your arrest? Yeah. Take him away. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You've been arrested for the murder of Sister Philomena Lyons at Clonus Road, Bally Bay, on Saturday morning, the 15th of December 2001. Do you understand that? Yes, I know that. And I did do it. Did you know the lady was a nun? I did. And how did you do it? I dragged her up from the lane and done it with her scarf. No, 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 no. Go back further than that. Go back to the very beginning. I, I bought a carton of apple juice in a spa shop from a girl that I didn't know who she was. I saw a tall 
woman wearing a black coat, black trousers and black shoes, about 39 to 45 years of age. And I got the urge to have that sex of her. She was 200 yards out the road when I set out after her. After a short distance, I saw a man at a car. He sat into it and got back out. I slowed down to avoid meeting him. I then walked on by and found the woman I was finding had gone out of my sight. Hello. Good morning, sister. How are you? Keelan Heron was returning from a night with his girlfriend. The woman who became the focus of his attention was the care worker who greeted Sister Philomena that fateful morning. Thank you, you too. At this point, the Cloners Road, I noticed a nun standing on the right-hand side near the wall outside St. Joseph's nursing home. When I saw the nun, I decided to sex of her instead. I could see she was a nun because she was wearing nun's clothes with a veil and a black scarf wrapped around her neck. She was about in her 60s and she was wearing glasses. I ran at her, grabbed her around the neck with my right hand around her neck and mouth my left hand grabbing her back. I dragged her back into the ground and I ran backwards with her feet dragging along the ground. Did she have her glasses on? She did. Did you take her glasses off? I did not. Did you touch her glasses? I put my hands around her face when I was dragging her up the lane. And my hand might have been over her glasses, but I didn't take them off. <laughs> While she was dead, I got up off her and I left her lying on the grass as she was. I then went home and I went to bed. We never came to a conclusion why Keelan carried out this attack for he had no history of this type of activity. It was announced, uh, I suppose, on the Wednesday evening who the uh, person was that had been charged with the murder. And I think people locally were shocked, I suppose, that it was a local because for the few days of the investigation, they'd been hoping maybe that it wasn't a local, that it was an outsider or a stranger just passing through the town that morning. When they found out it was not only a local, but a person whose family were well known and well respected in the area, people were very much taken aback. On the morning of the trial, he pleaded guilty to murder and he received a life sentence. During the hearing of that case, Keelan Heron expressed sorrow for what he had done and apologised to the family of Sister Philomena and to her sister nuns in the convent in Bally Bay. The convent itself is quite close to the town and has been an integral part of the town and the area and that is why there was such shock because people knew the nuns so well and the nuns themselves were uh, very much involved in the community, particularly Sister Philomena. This was the first nun to be murdered in Ireland, or in modern Ireland at least, and uh, it, has been, it, it will live with Bally Bay for a long time. The people of the locality were really horrified to think that such a traumatic experience happened to a person who was consecrated to God as a sister for 51 years and lived a whole life doing good to everybody. We would like her to be remembered as somebody who was very, very selfless, very dedicated, somebody who is loving, compassionate, and caring, and very forgiving. Sister Philomena Lyons would have forgiven uh, Killian Heron for this horrendous crime, and we too forgive him. <laughs>